so the book is really about two things. It's about the impact of the war on uh, the 3,400 men uh, and their families uh, from Pennsylvania County and Danville, Virginia. Uh, and it's also about the ways that those Confederate veteran families uh, um, uh, in the county and in Virginia more broadly attempted to deal with the consequences of war. So what happens to those who live? And what happens to the families of those 20 percent? Those one out of every five southern white men who are dead uh, in 1865. One of the things that, um, that I talk about quite a bit in the book is, is the concept of Southern social welfare. Welfare is typically uh, aid that is given to those who, who are needy uh, in society. For much of the 19th century, um, that kind of aid to the poor or aid to widows or aid to orphans didn't happen at the state level. Uh, for most of the 19th century, that kind of assistance happened um, in local areas, right? Family members would help each other out. Churches would help each other out. Um, local elites would help, each, would, would help uh, um, the needy out. I talk about each of those as options uh, that, and, and opportunities for assistance uh, in the context of, of the post-Civil War period. The problem is that there are so many people who need that assistance in, in, in the aftermath of the Civil War um, that the old system simply breaks down. Uh, in this case, the state of Virginia has to step in and help out and has to do more than it ever has to before. Um, but it wants to do so in, in pretty limited ways. Um, it, it does so initially in the context of um, artificial limbs for, um, for uh, uh, soldiers who have lost an arm or a leg. Uh, there's a, a, a brief movement towards that during the Civil War, but a sustained movement in the post-war period. And it happens in Virginia, and it happens in many of the Confederate states, and it happens in the North. And that's largely it in terms of state welfare until the 1880s, until you see um, uh, state governments um, begin to um, what's known as redemption in other states. In Virginia that happens a little earlier where, um, where the, the Republican dominated governments are, are kicked out and the, and the conservative or democratic governments come back in um, and, and we begin to see a lot of investment in um, assistance to, to Confederate soldiers and to Confederate widows and to, in some cases, even to the daughters of Confederate soldiers. Um, and so that takes place, you know, traditionally we talk about that in terms of pensions, um, you know, annual payments of um, 20 or $30 a year. Um, now these, these payments pale in comparison to what the Union is offering. The Union starts offering those, uh, those pensions and payments in 1862. For the war is, is, is even halfway over, they begin to offer those. Um, and in the Confederate States, uh, they, you don't see them uh, really until the 1880s. Um, so you know, they've, had to, they've had to survive for 15 or, or 20 years uh, even to get to that point, Confederate fam veteran families have. But at the same time, you, you do see, and, and we're not talking about a whole bunch of money. It's not even an, what we'd think of as an annual salary for an agricultural laborer at this time. But it does matter. It seems to have kept some families out of the poorhouse. It seems to have been just enough. Um, and, and you see increased pressure on the part of Virginians um, to provide this assistance. And so they're writing in some cases heart-wrenching letters uh, to uh, their state legislatures or to the governor asking for assistance, asking for help, pointing out that they made these sacrifices for the state, made these sacrifices for the Confederacy. And so even, even though the Confederacy doesn't exist anymore, there's still this sense that, um, that, these, that these men who have sacrificed, that these family members who have sacrificed um, deserve some kind of, of support. And so the, the Southern social welfare system that I talk about emerging uh, really emerges in response to this need, right, to the failure of the old traditional system of families and of elites and of, uh, and of churches uh, being able to, to provide enough support for everyone um, um, and in, through the expansion of these um, mental institutions. And one of the things that I found in, in going into the admissions records and the medical uh, case records of the, uh, of the men and women who were, who were sent there is um, over the decade of the 1860s, about 12 percent of the admissions to Western State Hospital were there because of the war. What also became clear in studying the asylums, these were the people who were the most violent. These were the people who had no one to care for them. These were the people who were, um, who would wander off um, and it were a danger to themselves or to others. 
Um, but they represented in many ways the tip of the iceberg of the psychological impact of war. The mental institution represents a very important uh, piece of Southern social welfare that, um, that, that, you know, before there was such a thing as PTSD, there clearly are people suffering from things that, that look like PTSD. And we have to be careful about imposing modern definitions onto, onto the past, but I do think that there's something, uh, there's something substantially uh, important going on there. There's a parallel between the experiences of returning veterans from Vietnam and the experiences of returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan and the experiences of returning veterans in Virginia uh, and in the North. So here we are talking about the sesquicentennial of the Civil War and it really wasn't that long ago that, that we were paying um, f uh, to support um, uh, the legacy of that. Right? And I think that's a, that to me continues to, to, to uh, amaze me.